What you gonna do, brother, when the crypto bull run comes to you? The ticker is SmackDown on Ethereum blockchain, brother. We're the first and only wrestling-themed crypto, and we're bridging wrestling and cryptocurrency to make the most electrifying meme coin in crypto history. Ooh. Meme coins like Doge, Pepe, and Shiba Inu are leading the upcoming bull run, and we got the juice to turn our two passions into the next crypto phenomenon. Join the community at SmackDown.pro. The coin is Stone Cold Rock Cena Macho McMahon SmackDown 10 Inu, and the ticker is SmackDown. Just remember, brother, it's for life. This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. One that everybody wants me. Austin 316 says I just ripped your ass. This is my idol. You're gonna acknowledge me. What's going on, everybody, guys and girls? Welcome back to another edition of the SmackDown Review right here on the WWE Podcast. As always. I am one of the hosts of this show, Michael Ritter. You can find me on X at Michael Five Ritter and also one of the hosts of the Football Function Podcast available on all of your podcasting platforms, including on Patreon. First off, I wanted to give a shout out to everybody who's been participating in the Mailbag Show. Admittedly, I haven't been able to listen to the Mailbag Show routinely. It's not a part of my weekly routine these days. It kind of has its ups and downs for me in terms of getting into my routine. There's a lot of other shows that I listen to. I kind of tell you guys sometimes the podcast that I'm listening to right now. I've been trying to catch up with all of my movie rewatch podcasts, TV show rewatch podcasts. I listen to about four or five at a time, so it's easy to have your schedule pile up as well as, you know, the sports podcast that I listen to to stay caught up on all my sports teams and just in general, you know, I like to listen to other teams' opinions as well. I like to gamble, just being completely honest, and obviously, please gamble responsibly if you are choosing to do so. But me personally, I like to put a couple parlays down, whether it's on basketball games or football games. My record isn't exactly where I would like it to be, but hey, you know, it is what it is. Shoot or shoot. And eventually, you know, the balls are going to start going in the net. But nonetheless, I um, really liked what I heard from the mailbag this week. Just kind of getting back on topic there. It's been a while. Like I just mentioned, I don't listen to the mailbag as often as I should. But this week, I made sure to make it a part of one of the days that I was at work. I think it might have been Thursday. And I will be honest, great questions a lot of good conversation that was going on. You know, you, you really, you forget what you're missing whenever you stop listening to, to one of your favorite podcasts. And then whenever you get back in, you're like, man, why the hell did I take this out of my weekly routine? But I'm going to try to get the mailbag at least get the mailbag back in my uh, rotation there. But thank you guys so much for choosing the SmackDown review as part of your day. And, you know, obviously I, I really appreciate that. But We're going to get into a pretty good episode of SmackDown today. I really thought that this episode, you know, some people are more of a harsh critic than I am, but me personally, I like the fact that we're taking steps forward in multiple different storylines. That's what it's all about for me. I don't like the shows feeling like a televised live event. You know, you guys have all been to those live events, those house shows in WWE where titles don't change hands, storylines aren't furthered. You know, it's kind of just like, hey, we'll have some matches here or there. You might get a promo of a heel talking crap about the local town. But other than that, it's not the same as going to a TV event. I mean, I will say the crowd interaction, that's one thing that live events definitely excel at. And they do have the actual TV shows beat is, you know, it's not on a a crucial. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's all about a timed schedule. Like WWE has a very specific schedule that they do their shows, but the wrestlers are way more willing to spend some time, sign some things with the people who are sitting there ringside and going down the ramp. I've seen it every time I go to these shows and it's just one thing you notice, but this episode of SmackDown obviously felt like an actual episode of SmackDown where we got crucial promos. 
we got some developments in terms to the war games picture. So there's a lot of things that I guess happened on this show that I felt like were noteworthy. And that's not even talking about the Santos Escobar stuff. So we'll kind of get into all these things as we roll through this SmackDown review. But not only that, last week I mentioned if I am going to record my SmackDown review on Saturday because my schedule kind of varies week in, week out. It's never going to be the same. So sometimes I record these SmackDown reviews on Friday night. Sometimes I record them on Saturday morning, sometimes early in Saturday afternoon. If the episode comes out on Saturday, I am going to throw in a stack them up Saturday, a top five of something at the very end of the episode. Well, I'm sure you noticed by now, this episode was recorded on Saturday, so we're going to have another one. Last week, we did the top five spears, just going through the history books and seeing who had the best spear of all time. I gave you my top five. Today, we are going to rank the top five wrestlers worthy or positioned to take a swing at Gunther's Intercontinental Championship. More so, who is, I guess, worthy? Who are the top five wrestlers who have a shot at doing it? Because... As I'm sure you know, there was a report, apparently Gun- uh, Gunther had an interview, and he mentioned that he thinks he's outgrown the Intercontinental Championship, which, I mean, he's the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion of all time. Nobody has had it longer than him. It clearly makes sense for him to drop it at some point. I personally think that that could happen at the Royal Rumble. I, well, I, w- I went out on a limb last year. I was rooting for Gunther very hard at the Royal Rumble in person to win it. He ended up not. It was Cody Rhodes. I was very fine with that as well. But I knew, ooh, he has a shot. Gunther, that is, next year to actually go all the way and win it. And I have not wavered on that whatsoever. I know he's the Intercontinental Champion. It doesn't always make sense doing it that way. But nonetheless, I think that Gunther could eventually drop this title very, very soon, possibly at the Rumble, and then go on and win the Rumble in the same pay-per-view to keep his momentum going and to make him still, you know, just as credible as he is and allow him to take that step forward, which we all expect him to do, attack maybe Seth Rollins, who knows who's going to be the undisputed champion. I feel like the the winner of the Rumble this year should probably go after that World Heavyweight Championship. It just makes sense. Uh, we can go we can get into it as to why it makes sense, but I personally just think that number one it would make the uh, the championship mean more if the Royal Rumble winner chose to go after it in the main event of WrestleMania. Bam, already makes that championship feel more important. I mean, go back and look. In recent years, Royal Rumble winners have not fared very well against Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. So you might take a different route. You may have more success going after that World Heavyweight Championship. I feel like that would make sense for Gunther. And because he is my pick to win the Royal Rumble, and because it kind of ties in with this report, I'm somewhat reading the room in a sense of Roman's had an insanely long title reign. Gunther's had an insanely long title reign. One of these guys has to drop it very, very soon. It just makes sense. Gunther seems more willing, and because the Intercontinental Championship isn't the the top of the mountain, he can drop this and still continue to climb upward, which is what I expect to happen. But because I expect him to make that leap, he's got to drop this title. So I'm going to run through just a handful of names that I think could have a shot. Some are from Raw, some are from SmackDown. You know, I'm not going to allow the brand split to dictate this list or keep somebody off of this list because we all know they break their own rules anyway. So I'm not going to restrict myself whenever I'm thinking about the roster and who is capable of taking this title off of Gunther. But that's at the end of the episode. First off, We have a SmackDown to cover here, so let's get into it and talk about the things that happened on the SmackDown that aired on November 17th, 2023 from the Ford Center in Evansville, Indiana. Location breakdown brought to you per usual by DJ Kuzmo. Now, this episode of SmackDown, it started off with damage control. They came out to the ring. They kind of, well, first off, it started with a video package. There were a lot of video packages here. Um, in this episode of SmackDown, really throughout the show. But once that was over, we get damage control coming to the ring. And pretty much they're welcoming Asuka. They're welcoming her officially into the fold, into damage control 
as one of the most dynamic and deadly factions. One, I guess, analogy I wanted to use last week, you guys know I like to bring in the sports analogies. Well, thinking about how dominant this women's faction is, when you're talking about damage control, they were already pretty damn strong before. You know, obviously Dakota Kai was injured, so it was really just two active wrestlers. But Bailey and Io Sky are still a pretty dynamic duo when you're just talking about their in-ring work. You factor in Dakota Kai whenever she gets healthy. Obviously, she's going to improve the group. But then you add in Kyrie Sane, and it's like, okay, not bad. Not bad. This definitely makes this group a hell of a lot stronger. And then Asuka kind of just sends it over the top. It adds that credibility and just makes it feel more legit, I guess is the word that comes to mind. But whenever I was thinking about, you know, what can I compare this to? What additions to a sports team is somewhat synonymous with what happened? And, you know, it's it's obviously it's not completely apples to apples. There is a little bit of a you kind of have to cast a wide net and just generalize some things whenever you're making these comparisons. But I guess I kind of was thinking about, you know, the 2010 era and going back to the Miami Heat whenever they had Dwayne Wade and various other role players, some critical role players. Udonis Haslam was on that team. And they go out and they sign LeBron James and Chris Bosh, two phenomenal all-caliber NBA players to pair with Dwayne Wade they could have three-peated. You know, they could have won multiple, multiple championships. They ended up only winning two, but the potential was there. The ceiling was extremely high. And I guess that's what this reminds me of. Just adding this type of talent makes this group damn near unbeatable. I'm already going to go out on a limb and say I'm going to pick them for war games. I know that the group was officially announced a foursome that's going to be going up against this group at war games, and I'm looking forward to that match. But I'm a believer in this version of damage control. And, you know, this this whole opening segment kind of got interesting. It, it seemed like they were trying to tease Bailey's departure from the group a little bit. We've been getting, a, you know, some some hints at that in recent weeks and months, actually. But this one was kind of strange um, because Dakota Kai was kind of trying to deliver a line in a sense of saying, not everybody in this group is in damage control. And, you know, the crowd knew the camera was panning to Bailey. You could see the look on her face. It seemed like she was somewhat confused at what she was saying. And then Dakota, Dakota Kai quickly says, Asuka, come on. We haven't officially welcomed her in to the group yet. We have to do that. And yeah, okay, that's a great idea. Yeah, you, you took the words right out of my mouth, whatever. You know, it was kind of sort of, the idea was great. The execution if you go back and rewatch this segment, you could just tell Dakota Kai, you know, she probably could have done a little bit of a better job selling this. It seemed like the moment itself, just her delivering that line, it just didn't come off as natural as you would have liked. You could tell exactly what she was trying to do, and that's not necessarily a good thing. You want to you wanna get the gist of what she's doing without knowing that she's trying to, to do that. You know, I guess that sounded kind of confusing, but if you understand what I'm trying to say, it just seemed forced, I guess. It just seemed like not as smooth as it could have been. But that's my only complaint about that is just the execution. I feel like the idea was great, probably sounded awesome. Uh, and, you know, it let us know what's coming. This friction is going to be there, and I'm all for it because it is entertaining. It does have me hooked, I guess. I, I want to know what's coming next. And I feel like if WWE can do that with this segment or with this you know this program that's going on it makes me not necessarily wonder where the bloodline is or where roman reigns is obviously you want him there you want roman reigns on the tv as much as you possibly can but at this point if you expect roman reigns to be on tv weekly or even multiple times a month you're fooling yourself you know you have to be realistic i'm not going to you know lose any sleep over roman reigns not being there i'm not going to wonder where he is. I know exactly the drill. I'm used to it by now. It's just part of this title reign. They've reached the point where they cannot have him on TV every week because it would be overexposure and it would expose Roman Reigns to an extent, his weaknesses. The fact that they keep him so few and far between, he's able to really polish his next move. And whenever he comes out, it does seem like such a big deal. So that's pretty much why um, I'm not worried about that particular thing, or I guess just 
you know, I'm not going to let it bother me. But in the meantime, if we're getting stuff like this, these types of programs going into the winter on SmackDown, you know, sign me up for it because because it's pretty entertaining stuff. But let's go ahead and move on here to another thing that happened on SmackDown. We get the Street Profits versus the Brawling Brutes versus Pretty Deadly in a triple threat number one contenders match for the Undisputed Tag Team Championships next week against Judgment Day. And the Street Profits win. I believe they should have won. The right team got the opportunity at the championships, in my personal opinion. Nothing against Pretty Deadly. Like I said, they they took an injury. They were relevant before the injury. They came back. Really haven't missed a beat. They're starting to get over a little bit more with the fans. The Brawling Brutes, they take the L here in this match. They're the ones that get the pinfall in the Street Profits advance. But the Brawling Brutes do have that, you know, that typical straight from WWE 2K where after the match is over, we see the losing team in the ring, extremely disappointed. One of them kind of pushes the other one, leaves the ring. You know what's coming. The Brawling Brutes are going to implode right before our very eyes. Don't, I don't really know where they're going to go. I don't know what's in store for all these guys individually as a group it really made sense but you know what's rich holland gonna do you think he's gonna stand on his own as a singles competitor doesn't really seem like his category that he fits in i think he's more of a lackey if if we can get someone who is a heel champion that needs some type of support some type of muscle or a heavy rich holland would fit in that is speculation though obviously we're kind of going down a rabbit hole that really doesn't exist yet if you're talking about the implosion of the Brawling Brutes, this was simply the first seed that was planted. But you have to acknowledge it. Like, like You have to point that out. Like We see this happen time and time again with groups. Very rarely does it just not blow over. You know, We just saw LWO completely blow up. And that just came out of nowhere, I feel like. I thought there was a lot of juice still to be squeezed out of that faction. And it turns out they felt differently and they went in a different direction we'll see what happens here but i think that the brawling brutes days are certainly numbered as a group here on smackdown up next we get dragon lee versus axiom in a one-on-one -on -one match basically a little tribute to Rey mysterio who did undergo another knee surgery which that's crazy he's had over 10 knee surgeries in his career there, I mean, if you've had one surgery in general, you know how just brutal they are on your body. Like, you're not the same, especially to something like your knee for a wrestler. I mean, you even can take it another layer. Look at Rey Mysterio's style. Look at his skill set, what he does. It's a lot of explosion. It's a lot of running, a lot of stopping very quickly, jumping off the top rope, high flying. It requires him to really use his knees and the fact that he's this late in his career people are already wondering you know respectfully why are you still here ray like what do you have left to prove you're a first ballot hall of famer you're already in the hall of fame let's be honest there you've already gone one-on-one -on -one with your son you've already won the tag team championships with your son what is there other than the fact that the checks are still showing up in the mail i feel like it's because he's still going at an extremely high level whenever you look amongst the uh, the roster and you say, man, I haven't lost a step. And if I have, I'm still two or three steps instead of five steps ahead of everybody else. I'm still two or three steps ahead of everybody else. And Rey Mysterio, especially whenever you just talk about just being a pure professional, does not get better than him. He knows the business. He knows this industry like the back of his hand. It's truly an art that he's mastered. And the fact that he has, you know, he's had this knee injury and it's this late in his career. You do wonder how much time he's going to take off and um, you know what's what's going to be in store for him afterwards whenever he does get back. He's already mentioned you know, revenge for Santos Escobar. We'll see if he actually follows through on that. I do believe there are bigger fish to fry, but nonetheless, Rey Mysterio is going to be out for quite a long time, so I wanted to give a quick shout-out to him, and uh, you know, hopefully we see him back sooner rather than later. This match was dedicated to him, a battle between two Lucha Libre wrestlers, Dragon Lee and Axiom. This is my first time getting my eyes on Axiom, so I will say I'm not extremely familiar with him. His entrance is strange, to say the least. I mean, I feel like if you were to put on drunk goggles or just look through some type of, you know, glasses that made it seem like you were intoxicated, 
that's what it looks like. It's real blurry. It's kind of, you know, a slanted moving camera. It's, it's strange. And that's kind of what I, I mean, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing or anything like that. I'm just saying like, that's what it reminded me of as I was watching it. I was like, man, it feels like I'm drunk right now. Like this is, this is an odd experience, but, uh, Dragon Lee does get the win hitting Operation Dragon and he you know, might have found a home here on SmackDown. It seems like he's here damn near every week now. And I know that my girlfriend's son, whenever he comes on the TV, he knows who he is. And I do believe he's starting to become a fan of his just strictly because of the similarities to Rey Mysterio. But speaking of Rey, let's go ahead and talk about this other segment. Santos Escobar pretty much just came out and told us why he did what he did. He defended it. Nonetheless, double down. He said Dominic was right. Everything he said about Rey Mysterio was right. And what you're going to do, brother, when the crypto bull run comes to you? The ticker is SmackDown on Ethereum blockchain, brother. We're the first and only wrestling themed crypto, and we're bridging wrestling and cryptocurrency to make the most electrifying meme coin in crypto history. Ooh. Meme coins like Doge, Pepe, and Shiba Inu are leading the upcoming bull run, and we got the juice to turn our two passions into the next crypto phenomenon. Join the community at SmackDown.pro. The coin is Stone Cold Rock Cena Macho McMahon SmackDown 10 Inu, and the ticker is SmackDown. Just remember, brother, it's for life. Pretty much just, you know, crapped all over Rey Mysterio and his legacy saying, don't meet your heroes. Like we all say, you know, I mean, everybody tells you, don't meet your idols, right? And Santos Escobar said that Rey Mysterio was his idol and he met him and sure enough was not what he expected. So after he's crapping all over Rey Mysterio, Zelina Vega goes out to the ring. She gives him a nice slap right across the face. He doesn't really like that. And then Joaquin Wilde and Cruz del Toro come out. And he pretty much tries to tell him, hey, man, like, it was us three. Are you guys going to leave my side too? Are you guys going to join them and leave us rather than what we had got? I mean, remember, LDF, Legado del Fantasma. This was a, a very long-running group on NXT and even up here on the main roster. And then Santos Escobar actually attacked his teammates, or should I say former teammates. He attacked them from behind. As they were trying to leave, they were pretty much saying, no, like, we're not after what you've done. We can't leave the LWO and join you. So Santos attacks him from behind. He's putting him down. And out of nowhere, Carlito comes out and pretty much puts a stop to that. Santos eventually runs off, but we are going to get Santos versus Carlito. Hopefully a Survivor Series. This just seems like a Survivor Series match. You know, if you think of over the years, all these heated feuds that have culminated at Survivor Series. But one that comes to mind immediately, and I always reference this pay-per-view, Survivor Series 03. Kane versus Shane McMahon in that ambulance match. You know, on that same card, Undertaker versus Vince McMahon, buried alive match. Grudge matches happen at Survivor Series. Look at War Games for Christ's sake. Like they know WWE, for the most part, they understood the assignment whenever you're talking about putting matches on their Survivor Series card. And why not? You know, why not give me one that, you know, has this type of credibility? Carlito kind of. Opened up a can of worms whenever he pointed out what Santos did. Who knows how much longer he would have gotten away with doing these heel tactics. These little, you know, snake moves. Just cheating his teammates out of win. Screwing them over. Carlito puts a stop to that. Shout out to Carlito. Uh, he did not think that was very cool. Oh, Santos Escobar. So, cannot wait for this one-on-one -on -one match. But continuing on here in the show, we get Grayson Waller versus Cameron Grimes. Austin Theory was a guest on commentary, which reminds me, so was Road Dog. And I'm not really sure what they're doing. Like, what's their plan with all these former wrestlers and just popular figures coming and being guests on commentary? I mean, even Theory, like I said, was on this one. So, I mean, it seems like a two-man booth just isn't enough for them anymore. Not sure why. You have a legend like Michael Cole. He only needs one other person in there to kind of, I guess, give him a chance to breathe and you know a chance to take a drink of water and get a word out here and there. But no Wade Barrett tonight. Not really sure where he was. But let's continue on. Uh, the The fact that Grayson Waller got this win was 100% because Austin Theory got involved. Kind of flipped over Cameron Grimes on the outside of the ring. And... Uh, Grayson Waller hits a finishing move. They Road Dog said what the move was called. I didn't catch the name. 
I know it's been done before. It's pretty badass where he runs and does like a front flip over them and ends in like a almost like a razor's edge damn near. A pretty cool little move that uh, Grayson Waller broke out to pick up this win. But I, I guess it ended how I expected in terms of the winner and loser. Didn't really expect Cameron Grimes to get a win. But I am happy that he's still on the show. He's had some good moments here early. We just need to get him in mic time. You know, every time we see Cameron Grimes, he's just in the ring, ready for a one-on-one match. And that's his time from bell to bell to tell his story or to get us invested into his character and to, you know, make us want to see him succeed and get behind him. You got to give him more time. You got to give him more opportunities on the microphone. Let him come out and say something like, who is Cameron Grimes now? We haven't heard him say anything since he's been on SmackDown. We got to see more from this guy and we got to know why he's here. What's his role on the show? It'll give us a little bit, I guess, a little bit of a better idea as uh, what we can expect from him going forward on this roster. As I scroll through my notes here, we do get a one-on-one match between Jimmy Uso and L.A. Knight. But before the match starts, we get Paul Heyman, Solo Sokoa, and Jimmy Uso all out in the ring. And this was a pretty, you know, it was a lengthy, a long-winded promo from Paul Heyman. He even ran out of breath towards the end. You could hear him taking his deep breaths. But he was going and going and going, pretty much just putting over Solo Sokoa, reminding us how dominant of a win that was because it really was. He was pretty much just telling us, hey, it was a pretty big win, the fact that he beat John Cena at Crown Jewel. And he just wants to remind us all that. So... He's going on saying the things that John Cena will not be able to do going forward since he pretty much got a spike right to his throat. There's not really a whole lot he can do after that, at least in terms of promos and speaking into a microphone, the things that he really does well and separates him from the pack. But LA Knight comes out, which is nice because I really wasn't sure when we were going to see LA Knight, how he was going to be featured. He took a setback, losing your championship matches without a doubt. That's not anything, you know, that's good for a wrestler by any means. But the fact that he's still getting featured in these big time segments, that's what really, I guess, makes me feel okay that they're still believing in him. He's probably going to get another opportunity at Roman Reigns. That's another thing he alludes to whenever he gets to the microphone. He says one by one, he's going to take out members of the bloodline, starting with Jimmy Uso, until it's just him and Roman Reigns left. And then obviously you know, calls out Jimmy Uso right there and say, hey, we have a match right now, so let's go ahead and do this. We get Jimmy, we get LA Knight. Pretty dominant win for LA Knight. He controlled this match, probably 80% of it. Really not a whole lot of offense from Jimmy Uso. And then LA Knight wins with a BFT. Solo Sokoa does not really find that too amusing. He gets in the ring. They try to beat the living hell out of LA Knight. They try to put him through the announce table until he gets an unexpected ally, Cody Rhodes. Now, obviously, I love seeing Cody Rhodes on my TV. Was extremely excited. I was shocked whenever I saw him come out because, you know, why? I know he has beef with the bloodline, but it just didn't seem like LA Knight on a show that he's not even on. It just didn't seem like the moment for Cody Rhodes to come out. But, I mean, I'm all here for it. Sign me up. The only person who probably wasn't on board with this was probably Nick Altus, who tells Cody Rhodes to leave immediately. So, yeah, you know what you got to do now. You got to leave the arena. Cody knows. I wonder if he's going to get fined for this, what kind of trouble he's going to get into. Something must happen, I imagine. But the fact that we got Cody Rhodes helping, you know, LA Knight, are you guys good with this? I am. These two dudes are popular as hell together. They're both, you know, some of the most over baby faces. The only issue is that they're not on the same show, that it didn't make a whole lot of sense for Cody Rhodes to come out in this moment. Why was he there? Was he just back there waiting, just waiting for him to get jumped at the very end of the show? Like, nope. Like, what if he wouldn't have got jumped? What if Jimmy Uso and Solo would have taken the L and just left? Would Cody Rhodes have shown up for nothing? Would he have been in Evansville, Indiana, just, you know, going to the local IHOP, getting a nice pancake special or something like that? No. So that's my only issue is it wasn't like he was conveniently there and can just run out. He was there in a fully dressed suit, a nice suit, I will say, as usual. But he comes to the rescue and, I don't know, just... The whole logic behind it is really the only thing I can poke holes in. But for the most part, I am fine with Cody Rhodes and LA Knight forming a team together to try to take out the bloodline because that's apparently really all all you can do whenever the bloodline's against you. You have to join forces with somebody. And it appears that this team may have a chance to survive the bloodline, to say the least, maybe even dethrone him, one of them, you know, at some point down the line. But nonetheless, that's extremely 
extremely far-fetched. Let's move on to the final segment that happened here. Nick Altus told Shotzi, Charlotte, and Bianca, y'all need to find your final teammate for war games before this night ends, before the show is over. Okay, bam, they start asking people. One by one, all of the candidates that they offer you know, an invitation to get jumped. Damage control puts them out of their misery and they eliminate them from even having an opportunity. So the end of the night gets here and we get Bianca, Shotzi, and Charlotte in the ring. And Charlotte's trying to, you know, tell us who she's inviting, who she reached out to, to be on their team. And as she's speaking, she gets interrupted. She did not appreciate that. You could tell. She gets interrupted by Bailey and the rest of Damage Control, who pretty much say, who are you going to pick? Huh? Come on, who are you going to pick now? I already took out everybody. There's nobody else here for you to lean on. And sure enough, out comes Becky Lynch. I know this was another, you know, where the delivery wasn't as great as the, the plan. You know, the plan on paper, phenomenal. Becky Lynch runs in from the crowd. We get the nice camera view of her joining but I just feel like, you know, obviously the the audience, the people who were there in attendance, they kind of gave it away like they always do. It's not a bad thing, but, you know, they got loud. We kind of hear them and see all their heads turn to the back of the ring. And you see Becky Lynch come to the ring. It just seems like if her music would have hit, if we would have got her theme, bam, we got a massive pop. Damage control turns around. They're looking at the top of the stage, waiting for Becky to come out. And then she comes in through the crowd. Bam, the camera still shows her. She runs in through the crowd. We got four on four right there. They turn around. Holy crap. Becky Lynch. She's in the ring. We still get the brawl that we eventually get, which that's another thing. Not the, you know, smoothest brawl. Go back and rewatch this thing, especially towards the end. We had EO Sky and Charlotte having that little face off and they kind of just, you know, ran into each other. Michael Cole said all hell breaking loose right here. That's how SmackDown goes off the air. I felt like the, the execution of that quote unquote brawl was the exact definition of all heck breaking loose. Not all hell breaking loose, all heck breaking loose. I mean, to be completely honest, and this is a little bit of a ricochet shot, it seemed like something that you would see on AEW, like with their women's division. So I was a little bit disappointed in that, but nonetheless, we get the progression. We know who the War Games match is going to be. And I guess on that note, we can rejoice, exhale, and prepare for next week where we're likely going to get a pretty good go-home show As we creep into Survivor Series, which is always a great pay-per-view. Now, as I mentioned to you guys, it's Stack 'em Up Saturday. We got a top five to get to. Now, let's run through this bad boy rapidly. You guys could let me know your opinions and who you think has a shot to dethrone Gunther. Now, I just listed six names here. I didn't rank them just yet. I wanted to do that on the show. Honorable mention. I know that people are going to probably turn you know turn this podcast off right now after i say this name he's not on the top five but he is an honorable mention i'm going dominic mysterio and the reason why i mentioned him is because big things are probably going to be in store for him they're doing this is a big arc that we're witnessing he's just on the very bottom half he hasn't even reached that middle yet i think that if there's ever a point in time where dominic mysterio goes back to being a baby face there's a chance that he could be worthy and the right guy to dethrone Gunther. The reason why he's only an honorable mention and not on the list is because time. I think Gunther is going to lose that belt sooner rather than later. Dominic is, I mean, he's in the middle of his Judgment Day era, and there's no way in hell they're going to pull him from that to have him turn babyface to go after this belt. So the timing doesn't work out, but I felt like at some point it would have made sense to have that happen. Another honorable mention here, Austin Theory. And the reason why I'm mentioning him is because I truly believe that Triple H is going to eventually try to tap back into the potential of this guy. Vince McMahon was already on that route. He was already on the way to make Austin Theory the next big thing. And I think Triple H is a little bit cooled off on that. He's not as high on Austin Theory as McMahon was. But I think he still understands the talent. And, you know, there's an opportunity there where if it was maybe like a tournament or something like that, We could get Austin Theory be the new heel Intercontinental Champion while Gunther went on to bigger and better things. So let's get into the top five now, and this is where I really got to start ranking these things. And at number five, I think I'm going to go Drew McIntyre. The reason why I think that he belongs at number five is because he's kind of 
just like Gunther, he's a little bit above that, and that's not a shot at the title. It's more so just praise to Drew. He's a world champion. He's already kind of been in that mid card. I don't feel like him being the Intercontinental Champion. I mean, if he went on a seven, eight, or seven or eight month reign, yeah, it would be phenomenal for his career. But I just truly think that at the end of the day, like he's past that. You know, like he is swimming in the World Heavyweight Championship sea, and eventually he's going to catch something. But you know, I think that at the very least, it wouldn't be bad getting a one on one program with Drew and Gunther to see who can come out with this Intercontinental Championship. Number four, I'm going to go with LA Knight. I just think that it'd be a good consolation prize. He's a baby face. The only problem is they're not on the same show, so that does kind of foggy up the waters. I don't want to lose, you know, I don't want to lose LA Knight just so we can go over there and be the Intercontinental Champion. I don't. So if it, ha- if it comes down to that and a SmackDown guy has to win it, I would like them to keep the championship on SmackDown, which seems rare. I just don't, I don't. Unlikely is maybe a better word. I don't think that's going to happen. So, moving on to number three, another SmackDown guy, Kevin Owens. The reason why I'm giving Kevin Owens this is because I feel like big things could happen for him. Like, why not? I don't know if I've ever seen him have the IC title. I know he's had the US Championship, I'm pretty sure. It just seems like Kevin Owens fits the Intercontinental Championship. Like, he would make that title feel cool. He would make, even if he was a baby face, it would make it relevant. Almost like whenever Dean Ambrose was the Intercontinental Champion. We can get a similar run from Kevin Owens, I feel like. And, you know, him and Gunther would be a hell of a program. They tell a hell of a story as well. Number two, I got to go Sheamus. Not really sure exactly where he is. I'm maybe injured right now. But nonetheless, I still don't think he's ever won it. The only title he's never won, the Intercontinental Championship. It makes sense. He didn't get a chance to win it at Mania. He still wants to win it, obviously, so why not? You know, why not let Gunther drop that title to someone who's a veteran? And obviously, it would make him a Grand Slam champion. So I am, you know, rooting for Sheamus. And hopefully, he could end up doing something, you know, down the line that could get him involved in the Intercontinental Championship picture. At number one, I got to go Jey Uso. This might catch some people by surprise, but he's yet to win a singles championship. He's been a tag team champion time and time again. He's won a tag team championship with multiple different people. It seems like he was damn near swimming in. Hey, could Jey Uso be the guy that dethrones Roman? I don't know. People are starting to look in the bloodline for that next guy. And Jey's name kept popping up. Well, if we're talking about him being possibly somebody who could win that belt, you have to think he's worthy of winning the intercontinental championship, ending another streak, a different one. And he's on Monday Night Raw. He's a baby face. This has potential. But if this were to happen, then I feel like it would, without a doubt, really separate the Usos. Like, in terms of their, you know, their rank all time. Like, Jey Uso beating Gunther would damn near build him a resume to have another Hall of Fame induction. Like, the Usos are going to be a tag team Hall of Fame. Like, they're going to be a Hall of Fame tag team, I mean. They're going to be inducted together as the Usos. Now, Jey Uso defeating Gunther and ending his streak, that damn near builds a resume for himself to be a two-time Hall of Famer. I'm just saying that. So that's the only issue there is um, if Jey Uso were to win that, I do believe that Jimmy would be left in the dust and there really would be no comparison anymore. And some people already feel like there's not one right now as we speak. But that does do it for me here on the SmackDown Review, guys. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Hopefully, you'll come back next week. Also, tune in to all the other shows going on here on the WWE Podcast. And hopefully, you will take your your business over to the Football Function Podcast. We will definitely appreciate it there. If we could get you to become a funky, maybe tell a friend, tell anybody and everybody that they should be listening to not only the Football Function Podcast, but the WWE podcast as well. Thank you guys so much. Have a damn good rest of your weekend. Walk passionately in the direction of your dreams, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the WWE podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time. What? 
you're gonna do, brother, when the crypto bull run comes to you. The ticker is SmackDown on Ethereum blockchain, brother. We're the first and only wrestling-themed crypto, and we're bridging wrestling and cryptocurrency to make the most electrifying meme coin in crypto history. Ooh. Meme coins like Doge, Pepe, and Shiba Inu are leading the upcoming bull run, and we got the juice to turn our two passions into the next crypto phenomenon. Join the community at SmackDown.pro. The coin is Stone Cold Rock Cena Macho McMahon SmackDown 10 Inu, and the ticker is SmackDown. Just remember, brother, it's for life.